Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Fisher with the National Museum of American Diplomacy and thank you for joining our Black History Month program on Diplomacy Classroom. We're gonna record the conversation today. So look at our website and our YouTube channel, that link which you can uh, access this recording, that's forthcoming, so take a look at that. Um, and also when you visit our website, please join our mailing list um, so you can receive our newsletter so you can learn about future programs. Um, also, we will be taking questions today, so feel free to put those in the comment box. And our producers, Emma and Elizabeth, will be getting those questions to us. And thank you to Elizabeth and Emma for producing this program today. We could not have done that without your support, so thanks so much. All right, so um, some of our listening audience today may know a lot about the State Department and perhaps others not so much. So I wanted to review a couple points about the State Department and our work, um, which will lay some of the foundation for the conversation that we're gonna have today. Um, and that is the State Department is a federal agency that issues passports and visas. So when US citizens are interested in traveling abroad, they're gonna go to the State Department for their passport and perhaps another foreign embassy for their visas. So when they're traveling abroad, they can do so freely. Uh, it's also these documents that allow US citizens to return home easily. Also, when a US citizen is traveling abroad, they expect to be able to turn to the US diplomats at our US embassies abroad should they need support or help in any way. And that help could be if they lose a passport, they get into trouble with the law enforcement in that foreign country, or perhaps someone has died and they need support of the US embassy, they will go to our U.S. Embassy in that country for that kind of assistance and support. So issuing visas and passports and providing assistance out of our U.S. Embassies abroad, these are important services that the State Department offers to U.S. citizens and provides to U.S. citizens. But for many years in the 20th century, racism and fears of communism denied American citizens of these rights and these services. Robert Robertson, who is the subject of our story today, he was a naturalized black American citizen. However, he was trapped in the Soviet Union for 44 years. It's the practice of diplomacy and the work of American diplomats that caused this to happen. But, all, but also it was diplomacy and the ad, advocacy of diplomats that eventually allowed Robinson to return home. It's this fascinating story um, that our uh, nomad public historian is here to tell. So I'm gonna invite Dr. Allison Mann to come to the screen and join us in helping us better understand the story of uh, Robert Robertson. So Allison, thanks so much for being with us today. Hi, Lauren. How are you? Good. Hello, so, diplomacy fans out there. Nice to see you all again. Well, see you. And they will be happy to learn about this story that really has been your job to sort of highlight and bring to life. And I know that you were very excited about this story and you kind of what was brought to your attention through an object in our collection. Can you tell us about that? Well, I wouldn't say I was excited. I was more astonished and confused. Hmm. Um, a few years ago, this was pre-pandemic, I was working on a paper for a conference and it had to do with early 20th century travel between um, the US and the Soviet Union before there were diplomatic relations established between those two countries after the Russian Revolution. And our collections manager, Eric uh, Dyke, who's often appeared on your program, Lauren, said, oh, you know what? We've got a consular ledger um, that starts in 1922 and ends in 1939 that has some entries in there about Americans traveling back and forth. But maybe we need to take a minute, Lauren, and explain to our audience what the role of consular is so they understand what this ledger is. Well, right. So as I mentioned um, in the comments in the beginning, that these services that the State Department offers to U.S. citizens traveling abroad, 
passports or assistance that a US citizen might need, these are often provided, these services are provided by consular officers. So that's one role that a State Department diplomat can fulfill, the, the role of a consular officer. Super, really important to our work abroad. Definitely. And to our security, our national security, because the State Department is a security agency first and foremost, and our diplomats abroad are the first line of defense. They have to make sure that they look at all the paperwork provided, Mm -hmm. um, and then they have to use their best judgment. They have to apply the law to whatever they're looking at when they distribute these documents. And this has always been the case. Oh, so anyway, the ledger. Um, so Eric said like, oh yeah, take take a look at it. So of course I put my gloves on because Eric won't let us touch anything without our gloves. And I was flipping through the entries and I began to see case after case of uh, consular officers denying passports to American citizens upon basis of, oh, you know, join the Communist Party or uh, has been in the Soviet Union for too long, considered to be a danger. And that made sense to me. I got it. But I thought, OK, I'm not sure they were allowed to do this. Maybe they were. But then I was flipping through and I came upon this one entry that talked about a man, Robert Robinson, specifically noted his race. Uh, referring to him as Negro Mm -hmm. and saying that he's being groomed by the Soviets to return to the United States and spread this propaganda. And I thought, oh, my gosh, wait a second. So they point out his race. They say he's being groomed and then he's going to be expatriated. So he's going to lose his citizenship. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I got to figure out and unpack what happened. Well, let's do it here because I'm sure this is really a fascinating story. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I have some slides to guide this conversation that we're going to have today. Give me one second to move this. And so everyone can see clearly these slides that you've put together for us today. All right. So this is the story of Robert Robertson. And it's, it's crazy to think that he was in the Soviet Union for 44 years when in fact he wanted to come home, but he couldn't. So tell us why. Sure, before I do that though, um, Lauren, I just want to, you know, state that it's really important for us all to acknowledge that black history is American history Mm -hmm. and specifically black history has a lot to do with the history of diplomacy and foreign policy, because it's impossible to separate what was going on domestically in the United States with America's foreign policy. So I think that this story is really illustrative of that. Um, But yes, he will spend 44 years uh, behind the Iron Curtain in the Soviet Union. This is a photograph of him. uh, in when he was 17, when he came to the United States, he had been born in Jamaica, Um, his parents moved to Cuba when he was five years old and his father abandoned the family, leaving his mother to raise him alone. She was determined to get him an excellent education and enrolled him in a technical school where he started learning about mechanical engineering and tool and die making, working with machinery. He determines at age 17 to better financially support himself and his mother to go to the United States And he does that um, in 1923. He works for a while. He's living in Harlem. But what's going on, Lauren, in the 1920s in terms of manufacturing in this country? Where do you think is a great place to go? Detroit. Oh, yeah, maybe (laughs) Detroit. Why would you want to go? Center of industry, right? Center Center of industry. And specifically, which industry? Car. Mm hmm. Absolutely. I mean, this is like the the halcyon years, right, of the burgeoning automotive industry. And so he will go out and uh, move to Detroit. And we'll get to the Soviet Union story. You know what, for our audience, um, I'm going to say Russia. I'm going to, you know, exchange back and forth. I might say Soviet Russia, but we are talking in this program about the Soviet Union. Sure. Okay. Um, and this the, the the larger picture is him when he was young, and then the 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 sm- the smaller but larger picture of his face um, was when is from when he was sixty six in nineteen seventy four. Correct. Yes, taken shortly after he was able to get out of the Soviet Union. Okay. Awesome. All right. Okay. So we're looking at some documents. I know historians love their documents. 
we can't exist without them. It's proud, right? Um, you know, we we see what we see, but then, you know, part of our, our job at my job as a historian is to look at secondary sources and primary sources. So fortunately, uh, you know, just because I don't know about something doesn't mean that scholars have not researched it before. And African-American scholars in particular have been studying the subject for a long time. We'll have some resources at the end. So I went to those sources, looked at them. Robinson himself wrote an autobiography, which was very helpful. But then I went and looked at the record to find his documentation about when he became a citizen, because this is really important. So in 1929, um, he will become a naturalized American citizen, which is a is a process. And I think, you know, Lauren, you've got that term in our diplomacy dictionary online, too, if folks wanted to check that out. Absolutely. Yeah. To yeah. learn a little bit more about it. But I noticed there and I'm sure people can't see it on the screen, but there was someone had handwritten vacated and set aside in 1941. So I already knew that he had lost his citizenship, but I didn't exactly know when. So that gave me another clue that had finally been adjudicated in 1941. So to just here, here, we, here we see a, a document that gives proof that he was naturalized in 1929. So we have right. this paper trail that's right. now been generated on his being a citizen in the United States. And, and that kind of a, the proof of citizenship is critical for someone. Definitely. Definitely. And these are the sorts of papers that people would have taken with them when they would apply for passports and visas, right. copies of them. So the, the paper itself is created in 1929 or the document, but then there's an asterisk made in 1941. And that must have just really sparked your curiosity of like, what was happening? And then you started to uncover more about. Well, I kind of knew the, the end of it. And, you know, I often tell students like, being a historian is like being a detective and you know that there's been a crime committed, right? Like, you know what the crime is. And I knew the crime, right? Like he had been stuck in the Soviet Union, lost his citizenship, but I didn't quite figure out bureaucratically how this happened. Let's, let's follow the paper. Let's, let's go. Let's follow the trail. Right. Let's get our magnifying glass out and <laughs> take a look. Take a look. Okay, so, you know, part of his story in Detroit is just encountering virulent American racism. So he's he's well trained, you know, to walk into any factory and get a job on the floor. But when he goes to apply for a job at Ford, which is the biggest employer at the time in the 1920s, he says, I have all this experience. I'd like to work with the machinery and they kick him out, you know, and so he makes friends with another African-American who does work at the factory who says, look, you can't just go in there and because you're black, they're not going to give you the job that you're qualified to do. So but you really need to get your foot in the door. And that's what he does. He applies for a job sweeping floors and that job he gets. And within a few months, he's able to enroll in Ford's technical school. And after 10 months, he gets their in-house degree and then he starts working on the floor. So that would be in 1930. And it's during this time that a group of Russians come to visit the factory and they're kind of scoping people out. And then his boss approaches him and says, hey, these Russians want to get a cohort of employees to go over and work in a Soviet factory. Soviet Union at this time is really interested in American manufacturing and agriculture. It's a new country. It's only about less than a decade old, mm -hmm. and they want to learn and see what Americans are doing. And I think um, sometimes it's a, a little bit difficult to understand that just because there's not that bilateral relationship between countries doesn't mean that there's not exchanges happening. So what you're saying is we didn't have a bilateral relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. So right. So we didn't have a U.S. embassy in the Soviet Union. Exactly. But that doesn't mean that Americans and Russians couldn't travel back and forth between the countries. So and, it wasn't and, like it wasn't like all communication had just completely shut down. Right. And, and so this but opportunity I was just going to say, now. yeah, it's just weird because we always think of the relationship between the United States in the Soviet Union during the Cold War when there was like very little exchanges going on at all. And so what's right. important to like recognize here, this is the thirties, there was kind of people visiting each other's country and sharing of ideas, but the governments just weren't in those formal diplomatic 
having full absolutely of but still they they each recognize the citizenship of the respective countries and so when this opportunity was made available to robinson it sounded like a great deal he'd no longer be working as a ford motor company employee he would actually be working for the russian government and he would have a year contract and he was going to get paid like 250 dollars a month which in today's money is about four thousand dollars and this is like the beginning of the Great Depression. And this is like a dream come true. And he gets free housing. It sounds fantastic. And he really doesn't hesitate. You know, he's not thinking about, well, that's a communist country and I don't want to go work there. I mean, th these are very difficult economic times, especially for African-Americans. And at this time, his mother was still living in Cuba and he wanted to move her to the United States so that she could be, you know, living in a better situation. So he eagerly took this chance. And the way they posed it to him was, would you like to come and teach our young people? Like it gave him the opportunity to think like, well, I can share knowledge and I can go over and I can sort of train people. Mm -hmm. So it just seemed like a win-win situation. Yeah. Wow. What an opportunity, but it's really important to have that historical context to that for sure. Okay. So, well, um, some interesting things happened to him. Um, the passage is paid by the Russian government. He gets aboard the ship with his white coworkers and they immediately start putting up a racist stink about not wanting to eat with him and bunk with him and all of that. And so the Soviet captain, when he hears about this, he comes down and he lays down the law. Like, look, <laughs> there's a new sheriff in town. However you bourgeoisie Americans do things back there with your racism and all that, we do not do that here. So you were on a Soviet ship. You were under Soviet laws. I'm not segregating anyone. And if you don't want to eat, that's your business. But these are the meals that are served. Everybody eats and sleeps together. So that was a real wake up call for his white coworkers. And Robinson thought this actually might be really good. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, you know, living and working over there for a year just really to get that change, you know, of, of being treated equally really for the first time in his life. But this is not something that his white coworkers forget. And it's only two weeks into the job where a couple of them attack him after work and they jump him and try to beat him. But he winds up beating them up. And immediately thinks, oh, my gosh, I just beat up two white men. And he goes back to his apartment and he just starts packing his bags because in America, if a black man were to beat up two white guys, you know, I, arrested, lynched, I, I mean, you know, terrible things. And so he's immediately thinking that he's going to be deported and lose his job. But much to his surprise, the police come and he answers the door kind of like, OK, well, take me away, put the handcuffs on. And they say, no, comrade, what happens? Like they want to know his side of the story. And he tells them and they arrest the white men and put them on trial. They are convicted and they are deported. And this becomes a newspaper sensation extravaganza. And so the Russians will capitalize on this mm -hmm. and they will say things like, don't insert your American social poison into Soviet Russia, Americans like mm -hmm. they'll use it. They'll use it as propaganda to show the superiority of their political system in contrast with America. Well, and certainly he was uh, like witness to that. I mean, he certainly experienced where he was given the rights that he deserved. This is absolutely true. And also, though, at this time, there is no U.S. embassy in Moscow. This is in 1930. But there is a U.S. embassy in Riga, Latvia. And there are U.S. diplomats there who, who kind of get wind of this. They get wind of the case and everything because it's so well publicized. So they report this back to Washington and they tell the FBI to watch Robinson when he comes back to the U.S. So they are ready, like, you know, <laughs> are are flagging him yeah and do you think he was aware of that okay. i don't know i don't i don't think so but at this point it really wouldn't have mattered and so his year at contract is up the russians offer him another year contract which he accepts because the depression is getting worse and worse in 1931 and 1932 so he continues to re-up that contract without fear 
And in 1933, he'll go back to the United States for six weeks to visit his mother. He had been able to relocate her. He spends kind of the summer with her in 1933 and returns back to the Soviet Union. And this is a really important part of the story, that he does go home in between his contracts and then returns. Also in 1933, the United States and the Soviet Union um, recognized one another. So there is the establishment of an embassy now in Moscow in 1933. Okay, so just to highlight a couple things, this this image we see on the screen is a Soviet newspaper mm -hmm. that published this trial, the story of the trial. So not only is the U.S. Embassy in Riga kind of catching wind of the story, it's in print as well. It's in print as well. And you know what? I think I screwed up on the caption here. Um, so this isn't a 1934 issue. This is actually a 1930 issue. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have his photograph in there, but it clearly, you know, it talks about the trial. It talks about uh, the American injustice and the racism. And so they're they are using this case to really make a point. Okay. The other thing I want to just highlight here that you mentioned that he went to visit his mother. Yes. Six weeks. Yes. Can you tell us why he chose, I mean, I'm sure he missed his mother. He hadn't seen her in a long time and it sounded like he was very close to her and adored her, but why did he go back to visit her? Well, the, the, the Russians gave him a vacation. You know, that was one of the, the package deals of the contract that he was able to get such a long vacation once a year. And um, he didn't know at the time that there, yeah, he didn't know. There was a 1907 law on the books for naturalized citizens. Okay, so this came from immigration. And that law stated that if you are a naturalized US citizen, you cannot leave the country for five years or more without coming back. Otherwise, you're considered to be expatriating yourself, meaning that, okay, I renounce my citizenship. I no longer want to be an American citizen. They called it presumption. Of, of expatriation. So the American government presumed if you did not return within five years that you no longer wanted to be a citizen. I don't think he knew about this law, but it was irrelevant. He wanted to see his mother. Because he came home. And because he came home. Our listeners out there, stay with us. Stay with the story. I know it gets into some of the bureaucracy. But, but that's really, you know, there's a function of the bureaucracy in a way. And that's, I think, one of the things that the story highlights. Okay, so moving along. So he's, he's, he's visited his mom, he's back, he's continued his contract with, with, uh, with the Soviet government, as you said, to work in the, this industry. And then what? Okay, so I think we can go, do we go to the next slide yet or not, yeah, Lauren? Yes, we do. Okay, so in 1934, that's kind of when all hell starts to break loose, like in his life. Um, he is working very successfully in the factory. And uh, one day there is a factory meeting, which was common. Um, everybody who's working there who's a Soviet citizen is required to be a member of the Communist Party. So they regularly would have rallies at the factory. So this rally this particular day was to elect some folks from the factory to serve on the Moscow City Council. And to his horror and astonishment, they nominated him to serve and that he before he could figure out what was going on they elected him and so now he's elected to serve on the moscow city council um i think our boxes might be covering up that quote but he says without my consent against my will i was never asked they just nominated him and elected him so here he is now an american citizen who's not a member of the communist party who's been elected to serve on the moscow city council so here he's faced with the decision lauren does he say yes or does he say no? Does he say, oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not communist. I don't want to do this. Thank you for thinking of me. But yeah, no, I, I can't even imagine what was going through his mind. And what I'm sitting here thinking is like, oh, goodness, if the fact that he beat up two white Americans made it to the newspaper, what's going to happen with this story? And, and what's going to happen when the Americans find out? Because you just, by now we have a, a U.S. embassy in Moscow, right? 
That's right. So they have even closer eyeballs yeah. on what's going on in Moscow on the ground. Yeah. And he decides to serve. He figures like, okay, this stuff's getting wild. Like, I think maybe like I've been running, I've been riding this gravy train for as long as I possibly can, but now they're electing me to like, you know, these positions in the communist party. And so he determines that he'll quietly say, yes, I'll serve, but he's going to finish out his contract. And then he determines he'll return back to the United States. So he just wants to finish. I think it was like six months or something that he had left. And he's afraid if he tells them he doesn't serve that they'll deport him. So he's afraid that he would get cut off until he was ready to leave. Mm, okay. So things are getting a little more, more, uh, they're getting really uncomfortable for him. And back in the United States, this got out and it got out into mainstream news. So this is a Time Magazine article from 1934, uh, very soon after his election to the Moscow City Council. And that paragraph, I think, if you were a reader of Time Magazine, Lauren, and just kind of looking at it, what would you think is happening? that the black Americans or African Americans who were, you know, going to be seen as scapegoats for bringing, you know, communism to the United States. And there's going to be violence. I mean, you know, it was really striking to me about reading this particular passage is that the author of the article relied on 19th century language mm -hmm. of enslavement. Um, the word thraldom is an antiquated word for bondage or slavery. So they're actually, you know, putting that out there that if you have African Americans over in the Soviet Union, they're going to be bringing communism back and then they're going to start a revolution. Mm -hmm. and this is, you know, this is really serious. So this is like, and then of course saying that they're not as pampered, you know, which is like, you know, so racist and so already like this is really sort of becoming a problem. And so the State Department then they start sending him letters and telling him, you need to re return home immediately. You, you just need to cut your contract short and you need to return home. And the reason they tell him he has to return home is that he's not following the five-year rule. They tell him that pretty soon you're going to run out of time. And if you don't go home now, you're going to have to be presumed that you expatriated yourself. And we'll just assume that you don't want to be a citizen anymore. So there you go. So go home or we'll just assume otherwise. Okay, and that's what we talked about earlier, where there was this rule instituted that within that five year period, a US citizen needed to return home. And if he or she or they didn't, they would assume that they didn't, the United States would assume they didn't want to be a US citizen anymore. Only a naturalized <laughs> citizen, though, Lauren, only naturalized ones. So there was already that prejudice against naturalized citizens as opposed to native born citizens. Really important distinction. But, so, he did, but he did, right? He did return home. So what's he did, he And he had the documentation to prove it. It's just that nobody at the embassy was willing to listen to him. So he decided to go to the top. Uh -oh. Go to the top go. to plead his case. Yes. So he um, he's able to get a, a audience in person with Ambassador Bullitt, who is our first U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union. And so he goes to see him and he pleads his case with him. And part of, I think, you know, I think our audience will really resonate with this too, Lauren, is when you are pleading for your life, that's basically what he's doing here. It's sometimes you want to bring a buddy, right? Sometimes you want to bring somebody who will help make your argument and will help ground you and kind of support you in this. Have you ever done that? Of course. Yes. Of course. And right? I, I am expect fully expecting that that friend or ally is going to support everything I have to say and be there for me. Mm, that's the advocacy part, right? You want your allies to be your advocate, but it doesn't always work that way. All right. So what is the picture we're looking at, though? We see the um, ambassador and his daughter to the... That to is, the yep, daughter. on his way to take up his post. And then to the right, a lot of our viewers might recognize that. That's Spazo House, mm -hmm. which um, is the residence. And it was the actual embassy for a short period of time before they built other buildings. So it's the um, ambassador's residence. Yes. Okay. So this is the ambassador. Um, 
we you've you sort of he's been able to get an appointment with him it sounds like and yeah which is really hard to do and he gets it which gives him hope and he asks a friend of his this gentleman by the name of homer smith who is an african-american journalist who's very interested in studying communism who also happens to be in the soviet union and he's writing articles back and he's publishing them in prominent african-american newspapers like the defender in chicago the crisis which is the naacp newspaper and homer smith always wanted to talk to the ambassador but he was never able to get an audience so when robinson asks him to go he's like yes I will absolutely go with you. And so he sits down with Robinson and Robinson is, you know, explaining his case to Ambassador Bullitt. And he's about to kind of say like, and I have the documents to show you when um, Homer Smith says to the ambassador, uh, but comrade, uh, must this man go back to the States where his mother would have to stand in a soup line? You know, basically saying like, you're gonna impoverish him if he goes back because he's not gonna be able to find a job. But Bullet doesn't get beyond the word comrade. He hears comrade, it's like waving the red a, flag in front of a bull. It's a trigger word. Yeah, it is. Why is that, do you think? Well, because it was how the communists addressed each other. Indeed. There was no equivalent to a language of hierarchy in mm -hmm. Soviet Russia. So there was no mister, there was no sir everybody was comrade right so you use that to proclaim your equality but bullet went ballistic when he heard this and he said do not address me as comrade how dare you i am an american i follow democratic principles and then picked up the phone and was like get these guys out of here and a couple of guys come in kind of usher them out and robinson's like but what uh, wait like he's a tip but and yeah but it's like no you just you know you need to return home and on the way out the door smith says goodbye comrade ambassador and robinson says like oh my god my heart just like yeah. sank to my stomach i knew then it, i would have no chance of pleading my case not maybe not the best choice of a representative ally to bring with you to the well i mean smith made his point right like he said what he had to say but oh so i mean it really i mean at this point poor robert robertson who you know his his reality is just starkly changed right and i what, what what's hard to like deal with in the story is that so much of it he didn't really bring on himself yes he chose this amazing opportunity within Soviet Russia to go and have, you know, to enrich his career and make some money. But then all of these other sort of things started to happen to him that was really out of his control and like being beat up or being elected uh, to the Moscow city council. And so now all of a sudden his reality is very different. It is. And now he's really got to make that choice. It's up to him. So does he return back home? Now, um, his name has been out there in the United States. What, what do you think his chances of getting his job back at Ford are at this point, right? When you got the assault on top of it, right? And then there's this. And so he, he would be impoverished, you know? But so, and he's got to take care of his mother. Like he's got to keep taking care of her. He has that responsibility. So he will voluntarily make the decision to stay. And he goes to his boss at the factory, who's Russian. And he says, like, they're telling me I need to leave. And his boss says, oh, the Americans, they say that kind of stuff all the time. Like, they don't really, they're not going to take away your citizenship. And don't worry, like, when you, as long as you're here, we'll give you Soviet citizenship. So you could just become a citizen here. You can always get your citizenship back later on. We have good relations with the United States. Don't worry about it. Robinson says, okay. And so he does not return back to the United States and then back home. The paperwork is started where you can see it right here. This is a letter um, right on top of his petition for naturalization saying that they reported back to cancel his naturalization. And is that the asterisk that we saw to begin with? 
The asterisk is, I believe, when it was finally adjudicated, because it looks to me like they started in 38, where the attorney general started to sue, because that's what they have to do. And then in absence of Robinson being there to defend himself, it would just make its way through the courts. And so I think then that 1941 date was when it was finally adjudicated. And then that was when essentially his naturalization was canceled. So at this point in 38, is does he become a, a Soviet citizen? He does. He oh, does. Wow. He becomes a citizen, I think, in uh, right afterwards in 34. Yeah. So he does take that take that right away because he doesn't want to be stateless. He doesn't want to be working in a place where he doesn't have any kind of protection. And that's hard for somebody because then you you have no papers to travel with. And then exactly. Right. And that's 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 an important um, that's very important. All right. So let's let's see where we are. All right. So are we ready to move along? Yeah, let's move on. Um, you know, he never really loses that desire to to come back to the United States or at least to get out. But World War One begins in, in the Soviet Union 39. And as a Soviet citizen, World like he two. World oh, War sorry, II. World War II. Sorry, yeah. World War II, of course. Um, he is drafted and he's got to go before the draft board. And if it wasn't for his poor eyesight, he probably would have been slaughtered, you know, out on the Eastern front. But because he has a medical release, he's able to keep working in the factory. But then after World War II ends and the Soviet system gets tighter and tighter on its own citizens, um, he really makes that effort to try to at least get out on a travel passport. And so um, in early 1953, his brother sends him a telegram. His brother lives back in New York, telling him that their mother is desperately ill. She decided to return back to Jamaica because she wanted to return to her homeland. And so Robinson goes to the Russian authorities to tell them, my mother's dying. She's desperately ill. Can I please travel outside of the Soviet Union? And they refuse. They deny him. And you were only allowed to ask once a year. So that meant his mother died a couple months later. He had to wait a whole other year. He went back and asked once again to travel to Jamaica to visit her grave. And they said, why would you want to do that? She's already gone. What's the point? And so he's denied again. So you see here, he's got this, this problem. He needs to have an, a reason for leaving too, on top of everything else. But his intention is once he does leave that he won't come back. Oh, yes. And this is happening all over the Soviet Union. Right. They are really keeping tight controls on their citizens because people are getting these travel passports and they're not coming back. But he gets an opportunity to make a connection that will change his life in 1959. There is an exposition held in Moscow. And for some of our viewers out there who might recognize uh, the date, this is the famous uh, kitchen debate that happens between Khrushchev and then Vice President Nixon. But this is a picture of what the American exposition would have looked like. And the American government will hire guides to uh, serve in these areas of the American exposition to explain in fluent Russian to the Russian audience. So this is really meant for a way, it's soft power diplomacy, it's that people to people connection, it's showing America and what America has to offer. And you know, this happens to be television set. So a lot of it is technology. Mm -hmm. There is an African-American man who's working there as a guide. His name is Bill Davis. He was very interested in joining the U.S. Department of State, but he was unable to break in. It was very, um, the system was very racist at that point. It was hard for African-Americans to get into the department. And he had a job as an agent in the U.S. Treasury. He also spoke several languages fluently, and one of them was Russian. So when he saw the advertisement for guides for the Moscow Exposition, he applied and he got it. And he was only one of four African-Americans out of 75 guides to go. And he thought that by this experience, he could then reapply to the department and prove <laughs> that, you know, he's more than and than capable to serve the United States abroad. So he's there and he's talking about IBM computers and he's talking to this group of people. And he notices a black man in the crowd who kind of lingers behind after the, the Russians dispersed. And so... Um, the man came up to him and said in Russian, hello. And Bill Davis said, well, I'm going to answer you back in Russian. Hello. And they had this conversation in Russian. And Robinson says, that's who it was. Robinson, where are you from? And Davis said, Detroit. So immediately, right, they had that connection. They could bond. 
Yeah, they could bond. And they go out for a walk in the park and Robinson tells them what happened. And Bill Davis is horrified. And he says to him, I, 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 this is terrible. I, I would love to help you, but you're not a U.S. citizen. I can't advocate for you. You're a Soviet citizen. Like I, I, as an official of the United States government, cannot advocate for a Soviet citizen. However, should you find yourself in a different circumstance, please don't forget about me and I will help you. And just in that, you know, how do you help a non-U.S. citizen, right? I mean, I would imagine the paper trail, again, is really important to be able to paint a picture for someone that I originally was a naturalized citizen. I did visit, you know, I, I have these documents to show I did return, you know, as a way of really helping him build a case. It's super important. It didn't matter because, I mean, this is true today. I mean, American Citizen Services is a big part of consular functions and they are there to serve the needs of American citizens. But in this case, he's not one. Right. But Robinson doesn't give up. Let's move on because I know we're getting short on time, Lauren. Um, Robinson, I just want to point this out quickly. I'm sorry, Davis. When he gets back, he writes an article and it's published in Ebony Magazine where he talks about his experiences of meeting people and talking to other African-Americans who had voluntarily expatriated themselves. And, you know, even dealing with the racism that he faced in his own life, he still is very critical of the Soviet system. And what he points out is that they don't have freedom. They don't even have freedom to travel. And he's like, they don't even let their people travel outside of the country. And if it's such this great paradise, why don't they let them do that? So he kind of, you know, publishes this expose. Right. Okay. So fast forward now to... Uh, the late 1960s. Okay. So this is 10 years later, you know, and Robinson is still trying to figure out like how he's going to get out. And he never, never like puts down an opportunity to meet with um, any um, black people that he sees, you know, on the streets of Moscow. And throughout the 1960s, this is the decolonization movements where black African nations are asserting their independence, becoming independent nations. And um, Uganda is a very important part of the story here. The Soviets were very interested in these fledgling nations because they wanted to assert their authority, as did the United States. And so the Soviets would um, issue these calls for Black African students to come study at the universities of Moscow. Many of those students took advantage of this and they went to study and Robinson would meet them and speak to them. Um, so he made friends with some Ugandan students and they introduced him to the Ugandan ambassador to the Soviet Union, who is Ambassador Mutyaba. And Robinson and Mutyaba become excellent friends. And he tells Mutyaba the story. And Mutyaba says to him, look, I can use my power and influence to get you an invitation from officially the Ugandan government to come on a vacation to Uganda. Would you be interested in that? And Robinson's like, oh absolutely like this is the friend i needed <laughs> like you know this is the the person who's actually like working to help me this is the friend that i really needed and mutyaba returns to uganda in 1971 when uh, there's a coup and idi amin takes power and so mutyaba does he he follows by his word because he's still in the government and he sends a letter to the soviet union saying i am inviting Robert Robinson to come and visit Uganda. And so the Soviet Union wanting to keep good relations, they don't refuse this. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. And oh, the trials and tribulations behind even getting this travel passport were intense. But finally, he's able to use that letter to his advantage. He is issued a travel passport. And he is so unbelievably and understandably paranoid about the KGB breaking into his place and taking it. He goes so far as to cut a hole in his wallpaper and he puts the passport behind it and glues it up. Just, it's so precious to him. This is his freedom in his hands and he is able to get on that plane and he flies to Uganda. Immediately he will meet with Mudyaba who introduces him to Idi Amin himself. Yeah. I mean, so here like, you know, Robinson going from like this one authoritarian, you know, government like to another one, but um, they are able to get him a job at the Uganda Technical College because he's so skilled and he's an excellent teacher. And so he gets a job and they write the Soviet Union telling the Soviet Union he's going to stay here for a while because he's going to teach here. And that's how he's able to get a job and support himself in Uganda. It's also where he will meet his wife, 
Uh, she is an American citizen who is also teaching in Uganda, and the, she's teaching at that college, and they get married in 1976. So, but he's still wary. I mean, there are still Russians running around in Uganda staring at him all the time, like, you know, because he's still considered to be a Soviet citizen. So he's not quite safe, and he does have these fears of being even kidnapped. Oh, dear. So, but, you know, he remains persistent through through this whole experience. So what happens next? Let's go on because he didn't forget about that promise from 1959 with Bill Davis. And so um, shortly after his marriage, um, he th the two of them determined that life in Uganda is not tenable. There's increasing tensions with uh, Tanzania, which borders Uganda. And they decide that they just, for their own safety, that they need to return to the United States. But how to get Robinson, you know, back because his naturalization was canceled. So Robinson will write Bill Davis and Bill Davis promises right off the bat to help him. Bill Davis at this point now was a foreign service officer. He had joined the foreign service in 1960. Yep. So he was already serving past like 15 years. And so Bill Davis works with contacts in immigration and naturalization services. And often our diplomats do that. They work with several agencies, right, on all sorts of issues. And so Bill Davis is able to get him um, a a passport to travel to the United States. And Robinson is just so worried about this. He says, you know, I, I worried that the State Department was keeping files on me like that and I wouldn't be able to do it. But Bill Davis um, gets him that pass and he does travel back to the United States. He's able to see his brother in New York who he had not seen since 1930. Yes, bureaucracy, you know, wins in this case. I mean, you know, creating an opportunity, using the system to bring him back. And I think that was, is part of the point here. I mean, it's the inner workings of government that kept him there for so long, but it's also the inner workings of government that can get him back. It's like what you said at the beginning of the program, Lauren, it's like the practice of diplomacy did him wrong, right? And it would be diplomats, particularly African-American diplomats in Washington and also um, Black African diplomats in Africa, kind of all working together to right that wrong. And so um, Bill Davis is also able to get him a green card. And so he's issued a green card in 1978, which enables him to have permanent residency. And you can go on to the next slide, Lauren. Um, he will once again apply to be a citizen of the United States. And in 1986, he has his naturalization ceremony in Washington, D.C. Um, his first one was in 1929. His last one was in 1986. And he once again becomes a citizen of the United States of America. And uh, sorry for the folks at home, but that photograph... Um, Robinson will pass away in 1994, so he lives out his last years as a citizen, and that's uh, his wife in the center at his funeral. It's Bill Davis to the left, and uh, they're with um, Ambassador Mutyaba as well, who's on the right. And so they all have this reunion to talk about their part, and also Robinson's like incredible story. In amazing brilliant story and what i love about it it's really connected to diplomatic history and we think about history in american history um you, you know it's really hard to know like what is diplomatic history what does that mean what does it entail and this is such a brilliant story of how the work of the state department our relationship with other countries really plays into this story um the work of consular officers um and how you really highlighted it starting with that consular log that we have in our um collection so an amazing, amazing story. I wanna highlight one thing because we do talk about the work of diplomats and the skills that they use. And although he wasn't an official diplomat, he used so many skills that I know our diplomats rely on where he's, you know, building alliances, building friendships, learning languages, understanding cultures, um, trying to communicate what he wants, understanding the environment that he's living in, problem solving as, um, you know, situations arise that are completely out of his control and always remaining composed, um, looking for those right advocates to, to help him. So it's just a brilliant example of how um, diplomacy is manifested.
And he's an innate diplomat. He has all of the skills that you just mentioned. And at the end of his um, autobiography, which he publishes in 88, he talks about um, the ways that uh, the Soviet Union and the United States could improve the relation. And he talks about the people to people relationship. He kind of ticks it off. He says, we need to have more exchanges. We need to get more people going and learning the culture. Americans should really, really study the Russian language and culture so that they better understand it. And um, I mean, that is part and parcel, big part of what the State Department does. And so he recognizes he lived it. Yeah. For sure. And I just want to point out, here are some of the sources that um, helped you, um, re, you know, learn this story and bring it to us today. Yes, these are only a few. So I encourage people who are really interested in, in learning more about this subject to kind of start here. Excellent. And then I, I know we're short on time, but we, we do have two questions that I thought that I would just um, bring to you uh, right now. And that is, how was Robinson able to mentally survive for 44 years in Soviet Russia while away from his family and country? Allison Q brought that question. Yeah, he, um, he, he, learned, he did it because of American racism, that when he first got to New York and then eventually in Detroit, he learned as a, a, a black man in America to not trust people, to watch your back, to, you know, really always be very situationally aware. And after World War II in Russia, when all eyes because he was never quite considered to be a Soviet citizen. Like they, the Russians knew his history and they suspected him. They watched him constantly. And that's how he was able to survive it because it was something that he had become accustomed to in racist white America. Unfortunately, I guess that's the truth, right? Um, okay. Were there any white Americans who shared the same fate as Robinson um, or being stripped of citizenship and abandoned in the Soviet Union exclusively, or is this exclusively a Black experience? Uh, there were quite a few Americans who found themselves stranded in the Soviet Union. This was, this was another really interesting part of that ledger. So um, children who had been born in the United States before the Russian Revolution, so this would have been pre-1917, many of their parents had emigrated from Russia to America, and they had children here. So under the 14th Amendment, if you were born on American soil, you're a U.S. citizen. After the revolution was over, a lot of these Russian-born parents brought their young children back to the Soviet Union because they wanted to live back in their country under this new system. But then when those children grew into adulthood, they were like, I want to go to America. <laughs> I'm an American citizen. I, I choose, I choose to go back. Um, I think that this is something that will resonate with dreamers and, and people who have that experience, you know, in, in more modern terms. Um, I'm, I'm choosing now that I want to go back and they would go to consular officials in Moscow or in Riga or any of those Eastern Bloc countries. And they would, they would say that they're citizens and many times they would be denied to return to the United States because the reason given was that they had lived too long in the Soviet Union and they were ideologically unsuitable and they were dangerous because they could spread their communism back in the United States. So it really gives you a sense of the climate, like the like the Red Scare, right? Um, it, absolutely. But the, the seriousness in which these diplomats abroad took this, they saw themselves as guardians of the gate. And they, they were using their discretion and they were using the laws. And what they did to Robinson, they made sure that it wasn't illegal. They didn't look at his paperwork, right? But they gave him the choice. They said like, well, we're not doing it. It's only if you don't go back, there's this law. So it's really up to you. You really ought to go back now before that time ticks out. And, uh, uh, but in the 1950s and early 60s, there are Supreme Court cases that will make this more abundantly clear that you can't use that discretion in that manner. You can't take people's citizenship away without going through a due process. Okay. Okay. Well, that's living in a democracy, right? Where we sort of make these adjustments along the way. Um, last question. Um, what job did he do once he returned to the U.S. and where did he live, die? 
Uh, he was elderly <laughs> when right. he returned to the United States, right? And um, his eyesight that had protected him from being drafted into the Russian army um, was really failing. And so he uh, moved, he stayed in Washington, D.C., and he and his wife uh, lived here in the city, and he is he was laid to rest with, in Washington. His wife passed away in 2001. Wow. Wow. Allison, you're such a skilled storyteller. Thank you so oh, much for being. Lauren. It was complicated. You definitely helped it along the way. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us at Diplomacy Classroom. And thank you to all of you, our audience, for tuning in today. Please visit our website, diplomacy.state.gov. Join our mailing list so you can attend future National Museum of American Diplomacy programs. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Allison. We'll Thanks, everyone. Bye.